gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Good evening. You're listening to Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. We thank you for tuning in and hope you enjoy another exciting episode of our show. Another episode of Straight Talk with Cena Mark. It's the last day of summer. Fall is almost here. But it's the six man Dean Geronimo. And as always, from NJ to NC, I'm in the studio with my right hand man, Mark Lee. So, Mark, tell me what's good in your neck of the woods, my brother. Well, you know, Dean, you'll be glad to know I just got off from talking about you. That's right, we were talking about you because <laughs> today is International Peace Day. So I was on IBM.TV, and, of course, Kim was saying that she needs to hear from The Voice and all of that. So we had a lot okay. of folks, including some of our past guests that have appeared on International Peace Day. So Gwen Hurt from Shoe Crazy was there in the house with us. Uh, nice. Stella Adams, who is an activist that has uh, been with us on some of our shows as well as um, a couple of other folks that you would have recognized from just right here on what we're doing appeared on that show and we're definitely celebrating international day of peace because today is uh, international day of peace as put out there by the un so definitely had some great and amazing conversations that folks will recognize either from the replays of my shows that have aired on IBM.TV because I know Eloise, who is the Christian author, who has not appeared on our show yet, but who did one of those replays that we put on our network, um, was on. And then, of course, we have had uh, Gwen and I think we had Stella and a couple of other folks that have been on. So they were celebrating International Day of Peace. I told them I had to bounce off and they were going to get to a uh, music segment, but I knew that I I had my seven to nine obligations, and I told them that. And, of course, right. Zach was on the show, and I told him I had my obligations. But before I bounced off, Gwen was, I mean, not Gwen, but Kimberly was basically like, I need to hear that silk voice here on IBO.TV. <laughs> so you know you've got a big-time fan in Miss Calhoun, and she okay. was wanting to know when we're going to hear that voice and maybe doing some spots for that particular network as well as maybe just even right. appearing. Because I know that you have appeared on my show, so they have seen a, uh, a face with the uh, voice and all of that. So definitely right. it was just an amazing conversation. Brian Schulman, our LinkedIn influencer who has done a lot of great things, he joined in the conversation. So basically, as uh, I shared with them, you know, it seems to me that it should be a no-brainer. We should all want world peace and things of that nature. I know I was having this conversation with my mom a couple of days ago, and I was telling her that I was going to be helping them with the International Day of Peace. And, uh, you know, one of the questions that they ask is, what does peace mean to you? And mom basically was coming at me as like, you know, that seems to be a no-brainer that we should all want world peace and we should all know what peace is. But unfortunately, you know, Everybody has their different ideas, and of course, peace can mean different types of peace, but I think that we all understand what that small five-letter word means. So like I said, you know, of course, you can be talking about your mental health and your emotional well-being, so that can be kind of that inner peace. And then, of course, there are a number of people that might be talking more about, like, no conflicts and no wars and things along those lines. So even Mm -hmm. though you're not on the show right now, I'm going to put you on the spot because we're doing audio, so I'm going to... Put you on the spot, and I might give this audio later on, so you can send it to Kim. So I'm gonna put you on the spot now. So even though they cannot see that great face of yours, we're gonna put you mm-hmm. on the spot, and I will share this with Kim later on. But if you were to join, to have joined this conversation today, what would your definition of peace be, and how would you in, tell folks to engage in peace? And you know, it can be any definition that you've got of peace. But what does world peace mean to you? And also. What are your thoughts on the whole concept of peace, and how should we go about achieving peace? You know what? I guess it would it would be hmm, that's a good one. You, you got me this time. Um, I would say prosperity, energy, acceptance, creativity, and endurance. And when you put all those things together, um, being able to acknowledge the differences in individuals and when you acknowledge those differences in individuals you accept them 
the way that they are, not the way that you want them to be, not the way that you think everybody should be, but everyone is different in their own respective way. And to be able to acknowledge those differences, accept those differences, and come to a compromise, I guess, that, that would be another C. You know, to, to meet in the middle. We're not always going to see eye to eye, but we can have a conversation, sit down, and come to an agreement that is amicable for all parties involved. To not just take a look at a person or a group of people and go by what you've heard. How about taking a chance? And actually sitting down with some of those individuals, you'll come to find out that what you heard and what you see in front of you are not always the same thing. To be able to understand that people get mad, you know, but in time, time heals all wounds. And and you may need that space to calm down, come out of your feelings, instead of it being a a contest between who's the... uh, most aggressive or who's the most strong willed or who can overpower who then maybe we can you know stop being so self centered to the point that you think that everything you do is right and everything everyone else does is wrong that even comes down to things such as religion you know uh, they have been um, you know Christians and Muslims have a problem. Muslims and Jews have a problem. Everybody has a problem with everybody else for what they believe in. But how can I tell you that what you believe is wrong? How can I, how can you tell me that what I believe is wrong? You know, when we get out of our own way and stop being so um, small minded, that maybe we can get to a point where we can actually learn each other's cultures, traditions, behaviors, mannerisms and accept all of it for what it is and once we start to accept each other we won't have as many problems as we do now you know it's still a a carryover some people will look at us man and say look you know I heard black men x y and z but you don't do that how come well you know what what you heard and what you see are sometimes two different things I'm not going to get offended because They were brave enough to ask, but at the same time, there were some things that were passed down. You know, so sometimes you got to take what you need and discard the rest instead of carrying a whole bag full of junk with you. And maybe when we figure out how to do that without losing ourselves in the process, we can truly reach peace. That's my thought. Hey, that's a great idea, and I love the way that you framed that and everything. It's interesting that you brought up the religious aspect because one of the moments that I had on the show was very interesting because I kind of uh, was the lead host for about um, an hour and a half, two hours between the hours of five and seven. They kind of preempted my uh, usual Mullins Music and Memories show. So, by the way, you'll only be getting one tape unless I find a way to get the audio of this extensive show (laughs) that we did and everything. So you might only be getting one of them because we did do the uh, radio show with Mark Lee, and I had the pleasure of having a good friend of mine and a fellow board member at the Carolina Theater, Don Reno Langley, who is an author and deals a lot with her books, even though they're fiction books, with uh, things around activism. Like one of her books uh, is centered around a school shooting. Another book is centered around environmental stuff and around the uh, concerns around the dolphins. And another one is set in Africa. I think it might be around elephant abuse and things of that nature. So she does bring her activism to her books and everything. And we also had Simon Tam. That name may sound familiar to you. Simon Tam is the Asian-American um, musician who has the band called The Slants that, had, took, gotcha. that had a whole issue with the Supreme Court that they then took to, um, with the patent office, that they then took to the, to the Supreme Court. We had the pleasure of interviewing him because he came on the radio show with Mark Lee because after I met him with Sri, then we had the pleasure of having him on our show today. And he's talking about the importance of activism, even in his music and in all of that, because he often talks about how, wait a minute, 
y'all got all these words that got slant in them, but y'all got problems with it because <laughs> I've got it, and y'all have a stereotype about Asian Americans. So he was right. definitely called out. But one of the things he said is that one of the most profound moments he had was he actually had the pleasure of meeting a lady that we lost because, like I said, his case did go to the Supreme Court. So he actually met um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and met her in person, said that she was oh, wow. you know, short stature, but she just had – she just cut to the BS. You know, they were all over there talking about this and that. And she basically just cut to the BS and was like, wait a minute. Don't you all understand that this man is what he's doing in terms of representing himself and his community and all of that? So, like I said, he had utmost respect for her. And I can tell you that both me and Don were moved by the story that he shared. Because he was just talking about how, you know, he had gone through all these cases, had all these lawyers, all this high-powered stuff that's going on. And you know, she just cut right to the BS and was like, "Let's get, let's get real. <laughs> let's get to what really <laughs> makes sense. I don't want to hear all of the extra." And, and you know what? I can't be mad at her for that because when someone's telling you a story or somebody's saying something, you know, it's kind of like, "All right, get to the point." And in your mind, you're sitting there like, "Get to the point." Okay, you know, you you talk for 20 minutes, and I still don't understand what your point is. And some people are brave enough to say, all right, look, while I understand all of that, do me a favor and get to the meat and potatoes because I'm tired of you giving me the side, you know, so (laughs) it happens. Exactly. It happens. But, you know, that was an amazing lady. And I want to say that I trying to remember if I actually saw the movie, The Notorious RBG, or if I just had friends that saw it and told me about it. But either way, I've heard great things about her legacy. I've heard great things about that particular movie. So definitely, you know, we lost a great leader in the community. I am concerned right. because as my mom reminded me and everything, we've got to stall if we're going to try to stall and not get like a conservative or reactionary judge all the way probably till the middle of January. Because like I said, I was thinking that maybe we could just stall till the election. And my mom was basically like, no, Mark, you know, they still are technically in office until they get out of office in the middle of January. January 20th. January January 19th is the last day of work for them, you know. So let's hurry up and get to the 20th, man. That's all. (laughs) I'm with you. Let's let's, let's move to the world and make the world a much better place because we know the world has so much better potential than what it is actually having right now. So we do know that that is going on. So we definitely need to have this better world and share what is happening and just continue Mm -hmm. our dialogue and all of that because we just know that things have to be much better than they actually are. So that's one of the things that I would uh, share with folks is that, you know, we've had this kind of like – crazy period, both with the virus that has, you know, leveled a lot of us uh, in terms of our economics and in terms of other things and in terms of the things going on with race relations and Mm -hmm. even in terms of all of that. Simon actually brought up an interesting point about race relations because he was talking about how everybody's talking about we will be a majority minority nation, but I think he said 2040 or 2042. And while that is true, that kind of like, but one part of that is that that other half is actually very fragmented. So, like I said, if we look at it that way, then that's going to be a whole other issue. Because, yes, let's just say that it is 51% people of color and 49% uh, people of European descent. While the European descent folks might be divided as well, because we know they're Polish, Irish, and Italian, they oftentimes don't treat themselves that way. Whereas we've got all these different ethnicities, and we also got divisions within the ethnicities, because like Mm -hmm. I said, as he put it, within the Asian community, there are, you know, there's Koreans, there are Japanese, there are, um, you know, um, I'm trying to think of some others, Vietnamese. So that's just in the Asian community. We can also go to the African community with its various nations and divisions as well. And there's some, like some crazy hundreds of nations that are actually recognized in the Native American population. So while it sounds good in theory, that's a whole lot of division just within that people of color caucus. So like I said, we still might have to be dealing with a fight against the uh, folks that are in control right now, which is the predominantly white male, because even though they might not be in control in the sense of 
numbers because it's 51 to 49, if that's what the percentages have become, they are still the ones in control of the power centers. That's true. That's true. So maybe that'll start dismantling and we'll see what happens. Well, the first thing we got to do is we got to get rid of the crazy person. So let's just hope that we can do that during the election. I think I heard a doorbell, and that yeah, might mean did. that we got you a did. guest at the door. You did, and before you, before we get to the guest, I did want to give a shout out to my son, man. It's twenty third trip around the sun today, so you know, happy birthday, Dean Geronimo loves you, bro. So, and you said this is what number for him? Twenty three, twenty third birthday what today. Yeah, All so, right. You know, he getting up there. <laughs> you know, they all get up there. Everybody get up there. I do not have the pleasure of having kids, but I was thinking to myself that my nephews were born in 2008, 2009. That means that the last month in August, they turned 11 and 12. That means that they're just around the corner from those notorious teen years. And I'm sitting there going like, I could have just thought a few minutes ago that I remember them as like babies, you know, young people. And now they're over here in this like, almost near teen years, and after the teen years comes the early adult years. So I'm like, where did the time fly? Where did this happen? Where did I start getting you know, older? Because, of course, we always want to think that we are younger than we actually are. So uh, definitely I'm sitting there trying to figure out when that happened. And then I was also thinking, like I said, even though I don't have any, my brother turned that uh, great 50 last month. I mean, mm-hmm. not last month, but last year, last last year in October. So this coming month, coming up, he will turn 51. So he hit the big five zero last October in October of 2019, which means that he'll be turning 51 in October of 2021. And I just recently realized that he shares his birthday with a world famous funk musician. Cause you know, I'm always talking to my buddy, Zach. And I just realized that my brother Malik, who will turn 51 on October 26th, and Bootsy Collins have the same birthday. So I want to see what think about that. Did you share the birthday with Bootsy Collins? And, um, by the way, yeah. your Ravens did not help me in their defense. Their de- defense was doing good, but I don't know what the heck I was thinking picking up Tom Brady as my quarterback, and I'm about to go down 0-2. Even though your defense is trying to help me, I might have to make some trades. I might have to do some yeah. other things because I am hurting in the beginning of my season. But – at least it's not like real sports because I really feel sorry for my uh, schoolmate, Doc Rivers, who had a 3-1 lead and let it evaporate. So that's why he sent it home. But now the team that sent him at home, Denver, is down 0-2. And I really thought that they were going to pull out that game yesterday. But Anthony Davis had a whole different idea because he hit that game winner and was like maybe 1.5 seconds on the clock. And I'm sitting there going like, oops, y'all are going down. Oh, two. But we do know that Denver likes to come from behind, and they came down from 3-1 twice. But I can tell you this right now. They need to absolutely, this is just my prediction, they need to absolutely, not try to put pressure on y'all, Denver, but they need to absolutely, did I say absolutely about three times? They need to absolutely win the third game because I can tell you against the Lakers, you're not coming back from 3-1. You're going to have a hard enough time coming back from uh, 2-1. But you can forget it if you go down 3 nothing. Because, like I said, y'all have done some amazing things. But if y'all go down 3 nothing, y'all might as well just call it a wrap. Because I don't even know that y'all need to try to win game four because it's over. And, like I said, the Lakers will then be waiting for the winner of Miami and Boston and whoever comes out of that contest. But I'm just telling y'all right now, as somebody that is a sports fan and a basketball fan, that if y'all are smart – I don't care what y'all going to do. Maybe y'all got to clip LeBron or something like that, but y'all need to figure out a way to win game three. Because if y'all go down 0-3 on Tuesday, I think it's a wrap. What do you think, uh, Dean? Oh, you know what? I I got to go by what you say, man. Uh, my sport is back, so, you know, I'm, I'm strictly on that football thing, and, and I don't even have a favorite other sport team. You know, so <laughs> I got to go by what, you know, because basketball, you check it out and whatnot. But having watched basketball, man, I'll tell you how long it's been since I've watched basketball. All right, and then we got to get to our guests. The starting five for the New York Knicks was like Patrick Ewan, Allen Houston, John Starks, uh, Anthony Mason, and Charles Oakley. So that tells you how long it's been. Since I've watched basketball, 
<laughs> yep, that's been a while. But, you know, i got to tease my friends over at our other uh, organization that we help with and everything, the folks at IBM.TV. I think I found a new sport that you can get into. Since you're not into basketball, I'm going to talk to my buddy, Anka, and he's going to teach us the rules of cricket. So we're going to be – that's going to be our new third or fourth sport. So he's going to okay. teach us the rules of cricket so that we can add cricket to our list of sports because apparently it, along with soccer, is the sport – of the world because, you know, it's the sport with folks that got billions of people watching it. So I think soccer is the most popular sport, but I have learned that cricket might be second. So like I said, I'm going to get Anchor to teach us the rules of cricket. So, you know, in your case, it will be football slash cricket that you said you don't have any other sport. In my case, it might be football, basketball, then cricket. But we're going to learn about the rules of cricket so we can add cricket as one of the sports that we're going to get into because he's going to teach us about the rules of cricket. All I know is I've heard it's a very long game. I've heard that it can go for days. (laughs) Oh, wow. That might be too long. (laughs) Oh, wow. You know what? Let's see who we got waiting on us, man. And they've been waiting for a little bit, so we're going to bring them in the show. Caller, you are now on the line. Welcome to Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. Tell us who you are and where you're calling from. Hello, Mark and Dean. This is Jacqueline Wittenberg, Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Derek Wittenberg Foundation. How are you guys this evening? All right. I am doing great. And by the way, uh, Dean, if you do not know, um, I remember many people will remember this great legacy of an amazing coach from North Carolina State um, by the name of uh, Val Vanel and all of that. So, you know, that's part of that legacy that Derek Wittenberg was part of. But then he and his wife have gotten together and have formed this foundation that is dealing with some very important issues that are going on with our youth. So definitely uh, that's why I wanted Jacqueline to come on to share the story of uh, what Derek was all about. Um, By the way, um, Jacqueline, we've got to convert – Dean back to basketball, as he was just telling me, he's not a basketball <laughs> fan. He's strictly into football. So we got to find a way to get him back into the world of basketball, which is, I know, a world that was very important to your husband and all of that, but also important to y'all's career. So if you would just share with us a little bit about um, your connection to um, Derek, how y'all met, and about how the importance of basketball, but then also what the foundation is about. Derek and I are college sweethearts. Um, We've been married 34 years, um, and we have traveled all over the country with his career. As you know, uh, Derek was a basketball coach, Division I, for 28 years, and that took us around the United States. And we returned to North Carolina just a little over six years ago as he returned to NC State um, and his third time as an employee, he is an associate athletic director there now. And um, he came back as an assistant coach and then went on to become um, a, an associate athletic director. And so it's been a rewarding experience to come back to home, which it's home for me. I'm from Raleigh originally. And um, it, it's been a rewarding experience to come back here, although we returned to a very different uh Uh, Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, from what we left 28 years ago. The growth is is unbelievable here. Um, It's been a lot of changes. But um, starting this foundation, this has been something that's been a part on our mind for more than 20 years. But we were traveling around the country with his career and with my career, and we wanted to do this back where it started for us. And I was one of the very students that we serve. Um, so I wanted to come back here, and it's our way of giving back um, to North Carolina. And uh, what a way to do it because it's something that's really needed. But we do something quite unique through our foundation is we focus on that population of students who are mainly, uh, namely juniors and seniors that sort of get lost in transla- translation when it comes to finding funding to complete um, their college degree. And unfortunately, oftentimes we have a high dropout rate, and it's usually because of um, money. It's it's, it's, um, the only thing hindering these promising young people who can contribute something back to our society, our economy, our um, public school system. The only thing hindering them is not being able to pay for their their education, and so that's where we come in. We actually work really hard 
to raise money to fund not loans but grants. We don't want them to pay it back. We just want them to pay it forward. And so we've been doing this um, since 2015, and our goal is to reach every college and university in the North Carolina system, but we had to start someplace. So, of course, we started right here in our own backyard. And to date, since 2015, we've been able to award um, a half a million dollars, actually over a half a million dollars, in need-based hardship scholarship funding to help uh, college kids graduate who fall into that category, non-athlete, junior, or senior. And uh, so far we have seven schools that we've been working with um, within these five years. And we just added on, actually it's eight now, because we just thought of the Triangle area and awarded scholarships at UNC Wilmington. But we help students at Shaw University, um, St. Augustine's University, NC State, William Peace University, Meredith College, because we believe in the advancement of women. Um, so it, it, it's been a joy to be able to come back and to give something that is totally necessary, and it's becoming, uh, as a result of this pandemic, it's even more important now because a lot of these students rely solely on their parents for, you know, their uh, their education. And, you know, a lot of people get it twisted. They think that uh, when you go to an institution and you need financial assistance, you first thing you do is you run to your financial aid office. But little do they know, financial aid for many of the students that go there, unless they are classified as, you know, living on their own, but they don't have a job or anything, um, it depends on your parents' income. So, If your parents don't have a job or if they've lost their job, then you've lost your ability to get, um, you know, you can't get a low interest rate loan because you have no way, you know, no collateral or nothing to, for it to fall back on. So this is something that we knew was desperately needed when we started it and even more so now. And um, it's just been a joy to be able to do it. Sounds like y'all are doing some amazing work. And like you said, it's a very important in this day and time because of what's going on with the pandemic. Are you finding that a number of the students that you're helping are now coming to you trying to find even help with, like, say, um, the Internet and connectivity? Because I do know that that's been one of the issues. Of course, we've had some folks that are now doing strictly um, – either straight internet learning or they're doing a hybrid where they're going part of the time on campuses and part of the time um, at home and dealing with the internet. And unfortunately, we know that a number of our students, meaning the students in the minority community, don't always have access to those kinds of equipment. So is this something that the foundation is doing? And if so, how are y'all going about doing that? Well, we're not having running into that problem with the students that we serve who are in the university system because they already, you know, they're they're either juniors or seniors, and they're already, you know, equipped with Internet access. And uh, so we're not really having that problem. But the problem that we are, we are having is mainly centered around finances. The cost of higher education keeps increasing, but they can barely make the minimum before it increases. And so we're there to help them to that part just so that they can even get a foot in the door to to be able to come to a class or to be whether they take it online or go to it. And we do try to yeah. update them and educate them on what's happening as a result of the pandemic. Like a lot of the universities have gone to only online courses. But unfortunately, not every student um, can function and, and do, um, you know, perform academically the way that they, they, they would require in-person, to, uh, in-person instruction. So we, we find ways to um, help them with that so that uh, we point them in the right direction so that they can get the assistance that they need because there's no sense in whether you're in class or you're doing it, um, you know, virtually. It, it, it makes no sense to fail because you're not getting what you need. Not everyone learns um, under the same conditions. And so we try to educate them on that part. But basically, we really focus on making sure that they have the opportunity to even ask those questions or have a choice in how they learn. We have to make sure that if you, unfortunately, as harsh as it sounds, 
even with the universities, it, it's a it's a business. You have to pay to play, and you know, I, I've um, we had a very unfortunate situation. A young lady who um, was accepted, but because she couldn't afford to pay, there was no um, she couldn't get any kind of low interest rate loans or anything. She couldn't get in. I mean, she couldn't go. She was already in academically, but they offered no, you know, assistance other than the normal financial aid. And, you know, because of all of those other things that are tied into approval for that, she was not able to to go to that school. So here's a very promising young lady who has to start at um, maybe a community college, which I support um, in a big way. Uh, Wake Tech has benefited greatly from our organization. I love Wake Tech because they help us to be able to help students address some of those issues. It's less expensive to start out going to Wake Tech and then matriculate into one of these four-year colleges and not having having to owe, pay that much money to go. But you've already completed an associate's degree at, at community college, and then a lot of the, I know that NC State and William Peace University, and I believe Meredith, um, they all, and Shaw University, they have a um, partnership with Wake Tech. And so once those students complete their two years at Wake Tech, they can automatically get into one of those schools. And that yeah, helps definitely. them tremendously financially. So I'm a huge oh, yeah. fan of community college. And I think the quality of education there is just as good as any place else. No, I would definitely agree with that. What are some of the things that you think folks are not doing correctly in the educational system, particularly in the higher education system? Because we oftentimes hear folks talking about the uh, downfalls and the pitfalls of higher education, but I do believe that it's definitely something that is a great uh, benefit to society. But I do know that sometimes folks are afraid that we might begin to a point where it might become something that has happened in some of our historical places where it's only for the elite and not enough for the common folks. So it definitely sounds like your foundation is trying to fight against that. But I have heard that being a fear of the new ways of education because of not getting enough support to, for vocational training, not getting enough support of community colleges, and for a number of other reasons. But I was just wondering what your thoughts are about the direction that we're going in terms of education and how accessible is higher ed in the world and what are some of the ways that we can make it more accessible? I can say to you, um, many of the things that you just mentioned is above me. And when when I say that, I mean, I'm talking, we're talking legislation and all of that stuff. Uh, The people who control, especially with the state-supported institutions, they control what the tuition is going to be. And, and, you know, for me, my focus is to make sure that every young person who desires to get a college degree is finances is not what's going to hinder them from doing it if I can help. That's what our mission is, what our goal is. Um, so <clears throat> as far as, but there are a lot of um, things that are unfair, if you will. It's already designed so that, you know, mainly the elite, those who can, you know, they can get the education with ease if they desire to get it. Well, the reason we exist is to help people who desire to get it, who have all of, you know, they, they're they they're intelligent enough to get it. They're worthy. They're intelligent enough to get it. It's just that they don't have funding to do so. And so that's the reason why we exist, and that's what we focus on. Yeah, definitely. And who were some of the folks that inspired both you and Derek? I mean, I'm imagining that one of them, of course, was probably the late, great Jim Valvano, but I'm sure there were others as well. But who were some of the folks that inspired y'all to even get involved in this kind of field of education? And it can even be folks that folks may not know, like your parents or grandparents if they were teachers. But definitely, who were some of the folks that are y'all's inspirations when y'all are thinking about doing something like this, a foundation that is definitely doing some very uh, great work and everything. And by the way, I know about foundation work. My mom was actually one of the uh, was actually the first president of the Golden Leaf Foundation and has worked for uh-huh. a number of other foundations, including the Z Smith Reynolds Foundation. But yeah, Valeria Lee is my mother, so definitely has been involved in foundation work, and I've known about the importance of it for a while. But I was just wondering what brought you into this realm. 
Well, what we do is driven by passion, number one. But education was pushed in both my family and Derek's family. It was important. It was very important because, you know, our parents, they grow up and they don't have these um, resources and they don't have the things that they yearn for their children to have. And so um, we have to to look back at, for me, um, education was just pushed. It, it, It was something, it was a priority in my family and a priority in Derek's family. And um, I can remember my in-laws saying to Derek when he was um, playing basketball at NC State, you don't let the sport use you. You use the sport to create great ones. And that has resonated with him. Um, He's been on the Jimmy B Foundation Board for Cancer Research for more than 20 years, and he's an avid fundraiser um, uh, for the V Foundation um, and out of that, that happened because of his passion and his love of his coach. But the education part comes from our families. Our parents were deeply rooted in it, and it was something that was a priority until it was pushed. We were guided to um, – we were taught that education is your way to uh, create greatness in anything that you choose to do. And without it, it's going to be a tough road. Everybody is not uh, Steve Jobs, you know, who uh, dropped out of college and became extremely successful, and I I admire that, but it doesn't work that way for everyone. So the infrastructure was laid in our own homes from our our parents. And then for me, um, experiencing it, being walking in the shoes of one of the, the, the students that we help, the, t- the type of students that we help. I worked my junior and senior year in college. As a matter of fact, I worked for the company that gave me my low interest rate loan, so I felt like I was working to pay it back. I worked for the college foundation. And um, so I know the struggle is real, and it's even more so now than it was back in the 80s when I was a college student. But I know what it feels like to be in that predicament. And it's stressful. And unfortunately, you know, we lose a lot of promising professionals that can help us, help in our society. We lose them simply because they don't get uh, really what's required. And like I like to tell the, the students that we help, listen, your undergraduate degree is not as valuable as it was some years ago. However, it is a prerequisite for great things because it doesn't guarantee you anything, but it positions you for everything you still have work to do. Yeah, definitely I can understand that. And one of the things that I've always been concerned about, and we talked about it on the show before, uh, me and Dean as well as other guests, is that Sometimes folks, when they quote unquote make it in our society, they don't always reach back to where they came from. But it seems to me that both you and Derek are actually going against that narrative. And I've noted there are other folks that I would argue are doing the same. I do not claim that I was always the biggest uh, in terms of his basketball skill, LeBron fan, but I will give LeBron all the credit in the world for what he's doing in Cleveland in terms of actually reaching back into his community. It seems like that's what you're doing in Raleigh, where you're from and everything. So definitely it seems that we should have more folks doing that. So what kind of word of encouragement would you give to folks in order to get them to go back and come back to the roots of where they're from? Because oftentimes I find that too many, I would argue both entertainers and musicians as well as athletes don't do enough of that. So if when you're well, out there talking to folks that are in those fields, how do you encourage them? Well, let me just say this, Jesus. A lot of people are really confused by this. Um, anybody can go out and do something really good, but here's something that I believe with all my heart. It's not what you do that determines who you are. It's the other way around. It's who you are as a person, where you come from, your your foundation that determines what you do. So that's really my answer to your question. If you can't be honest with yourself and say to yourself, what am I grateful for? Um, What is my purpose? You know, what's my passion? Then it's going to be hard for you to make a decision to give back. It has to be within you. It has to be part of your character, who you are. It's not just something where you just wake up and say, I'm going to go uh, give back because, 
I think that's part of the reason why we have some folks who don't do that, you know, because that's just not who they are. That's not part of their character. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that that might not be part of their character, and therefore they can't, uh, don't have the wherewithal to do it or even the want to do it. So that's a very valid point that you make in that sense and everything. So I definitely agree with you on that. What is your take on how we are doing uh, as a nation in terms of like trying to work in the education system and with education in general, not just higher education, but all forms of education? Because it's my opinion that we've been actually taking steps backwards in terms of education. I actually worked for a testing company for a while, and I do think that for a while we might have got overly caught up in the testing world. But I was just wondering okay. what your thoughts are as to where the United States is and in the education system and even where we are globally and where you feel we should be going. Well, everything, it's, it's, those are very good questions, but they're not easy answers to them. And, and, and I say that because it's complicated because there's so many moving parts. To this, and I'll give you an example. Um, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to uh, meet with the president of ETS, the Educational Testing System, which is the the company in in New Jersey that is responsible mm-hmm. for all of the uh, required testing. You know, like the SAT, the uh, proficiency test that the kids have to pass in um, some states, their school required, whatever. And you know, my biggest question was this. If how can you require everybody across the board to take this standardized test and perform on it when you don't provide everyone equally with the same resources to get to that point to where they that where they can pass the test? So I say that because there's so many different moving parts to fix in our educational system. I mean, just I followed while I was living in New York. I followed what was going on here in North Carolina with in, in Wake County with the public school system. And I was devastated because I had a little niece here who was in the public school system. And it was just um, disastrous because you had a school board fighting against um, the system not wanting to make things equal across the board. But the same requirements were applicable to all students, regardless of what region or what district they went to school in. And so I struggle with those things because I think it puts, um, and particularly our community, the the people of color, it puts our children, you know, at a disadvantage. And so there are a lot of different moving parts that go into fixing the educational system. And so I just think, and a lot of it is tied into politics, local politics. Um, you know, it, it, it just, it, it, it's, um, it, it's complicated. It's complicated. But it's certainly, um, you know, uh, tied into local politics, and I'm speaking of just here in North Carolina and Wake County, and I'm sure it is in every state. But really, I mean, you know, um, it, it it has a lot to do with socioeconomical uh, status. It has a lot to do with geography. Um, and as you know, North Carolina is changing, and particularly this uh, Wake County. Um, look at the gentrification that's happening downtown and uh, all around us. The city is changing, and um, as the city grows and changes, cosmetically it's beautiful, but if you peel back the layers of things that really need to get addressed, like our public school system, um, all of those things, affordable housing, all, all of that, there's a lot of moving parts to it. And so education is, is tied up into that big old ball of yarn that's all rolled up that needs to get unraveled, but it needs to get unraveled by some people who uh, can see that there's um, a lot of issues that are affecting, um, you know, affecting our, our society. And so uh, it, it's it's complicated. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> no, definitely understand that. And you're right, it's got a lot of moving parts and a lot of complications involved in it and all of that. So I definitely agree with you on how you're phrasing it. But uh, one of the things that I think is very important, and we've had folks that have run for offices locally, is that while we want to pay attention and definitely need to be concerned about what's happening on the national level, and I would even argue the international level and definitely the state level, a lot of those decisions that 
are going to impact us the most when it comes to like school boards and things of that nature are at that school board and city council level. So I would actually urge more and more people to, when they're getting ready to go out and vote, to pay attention to what those candidates are saying and doing. And I'm thinking that that's probably the way that you look at the political landscape as well. So am I correct in thinking that you also... Go ahead. Most of the situations are made by, I mean, most of the decisions are really made by local government. And so um, I think it's important that we put the same effort that we put into to voting for our, our president. We need to put that energy into voting in local government as well, because many of those decisions are made at that level. Yeah. Definitely would agree with that, that we need to do that. Now, one of the things I do know about you, Jacqueline, is that you at one point before, I guess, meeting Derek, thought that you were going to be a biologist. Now, did you actually pursue that career at all? And if not, what was that pivot like for you? Because definitely I know that you've done a lot of work. I absolutely did. I finished uh, my degree with biology and chemistry, and I went on to work. uh, I've done some research on fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, I've worked in clinical trials. I've worked in uh, public policy uh, development in the full industry for approval of drugs. Um, I have worked uh, most recently at UNC at Lineberger Cancer Center in regulatory for some non-small cell lung cancer. Um, I've also worked at NC State with the College of Veterinary Medicine in the vector-borne diagnostic disease um, functioning, it's a working uh, lab with international cases. So I have um, worked in my field most of my life, and um, it's it's been uh, rewarding to be able to give something back to science. And um, it, it's um, it's been a joy. I encourage uh, more. I sit on a lot of STEM panels, and I speak at a lot of in a lot of STEM environments. And I really uh, try to encourage people. Um, to understand the value uh, and the importance of understanding it, even if it's not going to become your profession, to understand why science is so important. And it seems to me that science is becoming even more important in this day and age as we're trying to figure out what to do with the uh, pandemic that we're in the middle of, and hopefully they will find a vaccine or something along those lines. Have you been doing any work in that field of research, or is the foundation keeping you too busy that you don't have any time to deal with the, the research that's going on with the pandemic, but you probably have friends and associates that are involved in that research. I was wondering if you could share your thoughts as to how we're doing in terms of coming up with a vaccine. Because I've heard some people saying that they don't think we're going to have one for another two years. And I've also heard some people saying that if we get it, they may not take it because of some of the fears that have happened in our community around like Tuskegee and other experiments that have happened in the past. Well, I can say this to you. First of all, I'm not doing anything with the pandemic except for one thing that's extremely important, and that is making sure that I stay educated on what's happening. Um, I'm following that process. I am not listening to the media. I do not educate myself from the media. I look at the Centers for Disease Control. Um, I look to those scientists who are trained and skilled, um, you know, and, and I think it's an abomination that we have leadership in this country that actually tries to overrule or or um, talk down on the scientists who specialize. You know, and I and I listen every night when I'm listening when I happen to scan across it. Dr. Fauci, who's a world-renowned uh, pandemic specialist, why is our government leader, well, our leadership? Not paying attention, not listening to him, confusing the nation, and and not everybody has the wit, or not everybody is really interested in doing the work. I read American Journal of Medicine. I read, you know, I, I pay attention to the CDC, and I'm not opposed to calling John calling Johns Hopkins University, which connected, which is connected to the CDC, to get answers on things if I need them, and so. You know, um, I just think it's important that we all stay educated ourselves with common sense and and, uh, just listen to the experts um, in this area and follow that lead, not what you hear on the media, in the media, but really we do need to pay attention to the scientists 
who are out there working to find a vaccine for this thing. And no, it is not going to happen overnight. You can't put a time limit on when it's going to happen. These things have to go through trials, you know, a complete phase three trial. And I understand that the government's trying to approve um, a vaccine that hasn't even completed all of the phases of a clinical trial. That's why pe- that's the purpose of a clinical trial is to save lives, not put people at risk of losing their lives. Yeah, that makes and, a whole lot of sense. So just, yeah, it's just important to um, you know go through the measures of educating yourself and all the people that I know. When we get on this discussion, talking about the pandemic and talking about um, you know vaccines, I share that information with them and I tell them where they can go and fact check me to make sure. Um, you know that they're comfortable with what they, what I'm giving them, because I'm not going to share something with someone where I can't be fact checked from the sources who are the scientists who are working hard every day to try to find out a way to create a vaccine. To this thing is is different from anything we've ever experienced because it's a replicating virus, which means just when you think that you have um, address the virus It's already replicated itself Which means it's, it's difficult To actually kill it or, um, the, And that's why People get so sick and it takes so long To um, You know to get them well The ones whose immune systems are not so Compromised that they don't end up Losing their life to it So it, it's just It's really important that um, You know we stay educated And you know these crazy people who say I'm not going to wear a mask because it takes away my personal right. No, it doesn't. It doesn't take away your personal right. What it does is keep you safe and keep the people around you safe so that we can get this thing to calm down sooner than later while we work on finding a vaccine for it. Yeah, well, definitely. I can understand that. You have some great advice there and everything. Now, I did also say that you are a member of the AKA sorority, and I know that you've got a famous member as well running for vice president. So I was wondering your thoughts on Kamala and her run for the office, because I do know that she is also a member of that sorority as well. So I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on her being named on one party ticket to serve as the vice president, and who knows, maybe she'll win that job and then maybe run for president. But I was just wondering your thoughts. I think it's wonderful, and um, I think she's an intelligent woman. I don't think that she's there because you know, um, somebody thought it was popular to do it. I think she can uh, handle the job. I, she's she's proven herself to me. Um, and, you know, no one's perfect. Um, I don't know if anyone will even agree with every decision that they've made in different levels or different times in their lives or in their uh, careers. But I do believe that she's capable of uh, handling that role, being in that role like a piece of cake. And I, I think she's going to be found. And I'm really excited about um, hearing first the debate between her and um, Vice President Pence. Um, I'm excited to hear that. I think she's going to stand her ground. I think she's smart enough um, to do her homework, and um, I, I'm, I'm excited for her. I'm really excited. And, you know, um, it's great that, you know, she's part of my sisterhood, my sorority, but really um, she's a woman on the win uh with the win, um, as I say, win, W-I-N, worthy, intelligent, and necessary. And she's all three of those things. So I think that she's going to do a great job. Yeah, I think that you're probably right. She will do a great job and all of that. I actually had the pleasure earlier today of doing some work with uh, IBM.TV, which is the ones that do the streaming podcast that I'm part of, and they were celebrating International Day of Peace. And uh, there was a young lady there, Gwen Hurd, who runs a wine company, but she was talking about that they're going to start a foundation, and the foundation is going to be to try to deal with uh, unemployment issues up there in Richmond, where they're based at, and also deal with uh, trying to provide shoes, of course, to people that don't have that basic article of clothing. So they have not started their foundation. Y'all have been on your foundation for a while. What advice would you give to somebody that was trying to start a foundation? That's where that question was coming from. So if you were going to talk to Gwen or anybody else that was about to start a foundation, what kind of advice would you give them in terms of how to go about setting up a foundation? Well, the first thing is to make sure you understand clearly and you can relate clearly to others what your mission is. 
the purpose for the foundation. Uh, second thing is you want to make sure that you get someone who's really good at submitting um, the paperwork for um, a 501c3, which is what we are, public charity. Uh, that That is very important that you have that in place. Um, have someone who can um, navigate you through that part because um, that's the biggest thing. You have to get, um, you know, approval by the state to become a uh, public charity or a private charity, whichever you choose. But there is a process, and so you need to have someone who's educated in that area. And once you get through that part and you've submitted um, uh, everything that you need to submit, for approval to get a tax ID number to become a, a private or public charity. Um, once you receive that, then you, the next phase is, of course, you have to get um, submit paperwork to the Secretary of State to become, uh, to be able to solicit funds in your state. So it's some, uh, once those two things are the most important, that you have someone who's well-versed on how to do that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, I know one of the things that your foundation does is you do the big golf invitation. And I was talking to a, another friend of mine who's involved in the golfing community, and they were saying that that's actually one of the places that folks are still able to go out and do public events because of the space and, and the ways that they're able to do that. So uh, can you tell us um, the plans for the uh, current uh, golf invitation and how that is coming and how folks can get involved? with the Golf Invitational if they want to become involved and uh, what uh, will all be involved with this Invitational that y'all have um, going on? Well, this will be our sixth Gol- um, Derek Wittenberg Foundation uh, Invitational. And this year it's going to take place. We had to do some things, modify it a bit because of COVID. So usually we have it in June, but we pushed it to November 9th. So it's going to take place on Monday, November 9th at Wakefield Golf Club. And uh, we're really excited. This will be the first time we've had it at Wakefield. The first three years we did it at Lonnie Pool at NC State, and it was amazing. It was great. And the second, the last two years has been at McGregor Downs. Well, this year we decided to go to Wakefield, and um, we're really excited. And timing is good because Wakefield is, a bigger um, facility, bigger golf course, more spread out, and easy to social distance there. And um, they've hosted several golf tournaments since the pandemic hit, so they're well-versed in all of the COVID protection and everything. But normally ours is a corporate golf tournament, so with no individual players, we have teams only. And normally it's 25, 23 to 25 teams, but because of COVID, and uh, making sure that we keep keep everyone safe, we scaled it down to 18 teams. And what we normally have is four players per team, and then we add a celebrity guest to each team, so it ends up being a five-person team. Well, because of the modifications for COVID this year, it's a three-person team, and then we add a celebrity guest to each team, and we're only, we scaled it back to 18 teams this year. So we'll have different tea times, to, uh, and this will be the first time we've ever had tea times. Normally, everybody tees off at the same time, but because of COVID um, and the social distancing thing, we were having tea times this year. But um, we usually have a big reception fundraiser the day before the golf tournament, but again, because of the pandemic, we've done away with that this year, and we're strictly just having the... Uh, the golf tournament part of it. But it is November 9th and at Wakefield, and we're excited about it this year. Uh, one of the things that we're offering, because we know a lot of small businesses and um, nonprofits are hurting, and so this year, for the first time, we decided to open, extend an invitation to any small business or nonprofit that would like to uh, contribute um anything with their brand on it to go into our swag bag so that people will, our, our connections will know about their businesses. And um, so we extended that opportunity this year and we've had quite a few people jump on board for that. And we're excited to uh, 
give them some uh, marketing, you know, uh, as a gift from us to them. And uh, we're excited about being able to help out in that way, uh, see if we can get some people to go to those businesses. So, for instance, we have um, a company, a Civic Federal Credit Union. They donated pens that have Civil fe- uh, Federal Credit um, Credit Union on them, along with a little tiny brochure about who they are, and also sunglasses they donated. And this will go into our guest swag bags, and these people will get to to know about these businesses. And there are several businesses that are doing that, and it was our way of trying to reach out and help um, other organizations, you know, exposure, marketing. And so we're doing that. Um, all of our teams are, uh, we, we've um, been very blessed to uh, get all 18 teams sold, so we're excited about that. But we do have a number of ways you can get involved. Um, our website is www.thederekwittenbergfoundation.org, the and you can go there and find all kinds of ways to get involved with the foundation, but we do have um, available now whole sponsorships. If you like um, some marketing of you, you can sponsor a hole on the golf course. So we're doing a lot of, of that in addition to the other ways that uh, you can get involved with the organization. And you can also reach out to me directly. Uh, the email address is there on the dwfoundation.org website. So you'll find the the, um, the email address there and that comes directly to me, and you can reach out to me that way. You know, hopefully more and more people will do that and even get more engaged because it does sound like y'all are doing some great work. And I was on the website and saw where you were having folks that can uh, donate to help a student as well as become a volunteer with the foundation. So we do know that uh, in this day and time, a lot of folks are pivoting. And while they're working from home, they're also finding other opportunities, be that volunteer opportunities or be that side gig opportunities or different other ways that they are trying to stay engaged in their community as they some of the more traditional ways have been taken away because of the uh, pandemic and all. So I do know that there does seem to be more and more people trying to find ways to stay engaged in their community. So have y'all seen a rise in the volunteer support, or has it been about steady, or is that an area that you do need more help in even now? <clears throat> well, for us, one of the things that we do is – um, volunteers are absolutely wonderful. Um, first of all, we don't have a big staff or anything like that, and, but we do have skilled volunteers who are, have been with us since day one. And so um, it's very strategic in how we organize volunteers because I don't think the person who volunteers benefits very much from it if there's nothing for them to get to, if they, there's nothing for them to do as a volunteer. So I make sure that when we open that opportunity up for volunteers that we have specific areas that we um, need their, you know, need uh, their skill set in. And um, so we look at, we have a number of events throughout the year. This year, of course, has been less because of uh, the pandemic. But um, volunteers are great, and we're always looking for volunteers in specific areas. And um, so we make that known, you know, uh, based on the events that we have. And so it gives people an opportunity to use their professional skills in a nonprofit setting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and they can hopefully use those skills and develop those skills for other opportunities for themselves later on in life. I love y'all's mantra, by the way, and I'm sure that uh, Dean, who's listening in as well, will probably be able to relate because he works in the corrections field. But y'all's mantra is dream, believe, work, now finish. So it seems like a very simple mantra, but it's also a very powerful mantra. So tell us a little bit about how y'all even came up with that mantra and everything, because like I said, it seems very simple, but something that everybody should do on a regular basis, but it's very framed in a nice context. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you came up with that mantra and what that mantra means to y'all. It means exactly what it says. You have to dream big, work hard, and finish whatever you start. That makes and, a lot of sense. And that's, exactly. what it's all, that's what it's all about. And that's, 
that's the message that we wanted to send to those who benefit from our work. And, and that's, yeah, you know, that makes- um, we try to encourage our students. Um, that's what our mantra means. We need you to keep dreaming big, but you have to work hard because dreams don't come true unless you work for them. And then whatever you start, you have to finish it. Yeah, definitely. You definitely have to do that on a regular basis, and you definitely have to continue dreaming big and everything. I was just wondering, because I'm sure that y'all have had the conversations in your own house and everything, but we did, we were talking about the activism in the athletic community, but one of the things I've been very much proud of is the way that uh, the NBA has come out with statements around racial justice and things of that nature, and it's definitely been led by the players. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that, and if uh, Derek has shared with you what his thoughts are, because it definitely seems to me that the players took the lead in doing a lot of that and making those statements know that they are also going through these. I know I was watching the arena yesterday. Um, I think it was like one of the rerun episodes but Isaiah Thomas was on there and he was talking about how he even had an experience when he was growing up of of having a tank turned to him because I think he was growing up doing one of those riots that was going on in his area where he grew up and everything so he remembers having like a military tank turned on him and he also remembers having some other encounters with law enforcement so he definitely was able to relate to what the athletes were doing and I'm thinking that probably you and Derek have even had cases of that happening in your own lives. So I just wonder what your thoughts were about the ways that the athletes are standing up, particularly in the NBA, but also the NFL and a number of the other leagues. Uh, I think it's wonderful what they're doing. I can't speak for Derek, but because I know his heart and I know that he um, is very tuned in to social injustices. And um, I know that he feels strongly about something needs to be done. And if we don't stand up and take a stance, and and really try to educate the opposers, oh, you know, because you know we found ourselves in this com- we find ourselves in this conversation all the time. Um, you know, the first thing that I hear come out of an opposer's mouth is that when when athletes don't uh, stand for the national anthem when they choose to kneel, is they start talking about uh, disrespecting the flag. It isn't about the flag, and so it's very important that we stay on on the, the of educating people that those opposers that do we do encounter is that this has nothing to do with um disrespecting the American flag. It has everything to do with what the flag stands for, which means justice and equality for all. And I don't understand why it is that they can't see that there's an imbalance and in, 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 uh, there's definitely not equal justice here. And, you know, it's not just what you see in the, the, uh, in the news or you, or these uh, cases with, like, George Floyd and Trayvon Martin. All they have to do is look at the t- statistics and be willing to accept that it is what it is. Then they would have a completely different outlook on what's happening when these athletes choose to kneel and, as opposed to stand. It has nothing to do with the flag. It's, it's far deeper than that. And so, yep, yes, definitely... we do have those discussions. We have them in our house, um, but we also have we have nieces and nephews. And so we talk about those things. But we also like to talk to our friends that don't look like us, who don't see through our lens, who can't walk in our shoes because they're not us, and we can't walk in their shoes because we're not them. But we have to, education is key. It is key. And then getting people to embrace it. You know, cause, uh, you know I think, uh, here's what I, I do believe, though. I believe some of these very people who are um, raising cane about um of standing up, people standing up um, for injustices and bringing it to the forefront, they know that it's a problem that needs to be addressed. They're just not willing to embrace it for a number of reasons, you know, uh, money, power, greed, control, um, for a number of reasons. And I think it's great that um, I, I say we need to keep, you know, we need to keep pushing, we need to keep fighting. And, um, yeah, we you know, definitely. As, as the late John Lewis said, get into good trouble. 
get into good trouble. We need to continue that. Yeah, you're right about that. We definitely have to follow in what John Lewis was talking about when he was talking about that good trouble and all of that. Now, both through your work as well as uh, traveling around the country and everything through your husband's work and what y'all have done now coming back to Raleigh, um, a lot of these issues are national issues, but I would even argue global issues. Cause like I said, I'm here in North Carolina. Dean is in New Jersey, but we oftentimes, both on this show as well as just in our regular conversations, we'll talk about how a lot of these issues are issues that are happening throughout the uh, state. They might be both in California, they might be in North Carolina, and in sometimes even different Group. So, like I said, maybe it's happening with not just our African American community, but our Latin brothers in uh, California and in Texas. So, I was just wondering if you could talk about how that travel and that um, experience of going around the world has helped even frame your own education and your own thoughts about dealing with these issues because you've had the pleasure of traveling around not just the country, but around the world. So, I just wondered if you could talk about how that's been important to you and how it's helped frame the person that Jacqueline Wittenberg is. Well, I have to tell you, it's been very different for me um, because I've lived a lot of places. But uh, I'll give you an example um, h- how different it is. I lived, uh, we were on the West Coast, in the Midwest for a while. We were in California, and then we went to, um, to uh, Boulder, Colorado. And I have to tell you, um, that was by far my favorite place to live in terms of um, society and how they view people of color. When I lived in Boulder, I expected because Colorado is a state that's, um, uh, you know, predominantly white, Caucasian. And um, so when I just found out that we were moving there, you know, I said, oh, boy, let me get my mind right to this. Well, I got there and I was pleasantly surprised that, but I, I had to go back and look at the history of the state and why the mindset is so different there. It's different because back in the 50s uh, and in the 60s, the military, if there were uh, people of different races um, marrying or dating or whatever, um, to deal with that, their way of dealing with it was to station those people in Colorado. So they were in, uh, I think, Fort Collins was the military base there, Colorado Springs. And many of those people went on to, you know, live and raise their families there. So there is a lot of um, uh, biracial couples and families, and um, and the mindset was different. So, um, but when I left there, we went to Atlanta, and, of course, it's the total opposite, where it's a very large uh, African-American population there. So the racism that you experience in different pockets, Atlanta is a very uh, different uh, city because you've got um, your your Buckhead area, which is where a lot of the wealth is and, and Several, it's been a while since I've lived here, so I can't remember all the communities. But I do remember I, at the time I owned the consulting business, and all of my clients were in two places, the two what we call the high-rent district, which was Buckhead and Dunwoody. That was the other town. So everywhere else I would go throughout the city of Atlanta, no issue. But once I stepped in to do my work with my clients in those areas, that's when I really started to experience. And and you experience the racism on a different level, and it may come to, it's not like they lash out and call your names or anything, but they question your integrity. They question your intellect. They question. So you have to find ways to navigate through that. And so um, leaving there and then living 15 years in New York, once again, you experience it at different, in different ways and on different levels depending on where you are. And uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting thing, but I didn't expect to come back to North Carolina and see it, it's really uh, probably worse here now than it was when I was growing up here and even when I was in college here. And a lot of that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, growth and the cosmetic changes and, you know, people being shifted uh, 
in different directions. And, and so um, it, it, it's it's deep. It, it's deep here. It, it's been um, – I've had to uh, really um, just – sit back and think of ways to navigate myself through it here. It, it's deep here. It's deeply rooted, too. And all you have to do is just listen to professional people talk, um, and, and you'll hear it come out. It's not a blatant thing, but it comes out because you're smart enough when you've been to other, you've lived in other states, you're smart enough to know when it's happening. It just happens in different ways, on different levels. Yep, and you're right about that. And actually, uh, Dean will be going through that once he retires because I know one of the things that we've talked about is that uh, after he retires, uh, Dean, when is that retirement coming up? Is that another five years or ten years from now? Because he's talked about that he's going to move back to Virginia and bring his uh, wife and family down this way because they're living Um, in the New Jersey area right now. So, Dean, when is that move going to happen? I don't think I'm coming all the way back down to Virginia, dog, but that'll be in like seven (laughs) years. You know what I mean? That seven, seven years, years all of that down and gone might be like either Delaware or maybe the upper part of Maryland, but I spent my first 23 years in Virginia. So, you know, I moved and, and saw a few places. So I always come home to visit, but um, I don't know if I will come back and stay, though. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like for you, Jacqueline? And what made you decide that you wanted to come back? Because, like I said, you had the pleasure of traveling all over the world, but something drew you back to North Carolina. And I was wondering what that was that drew you back to Raleigh, which is home for you and everything. Um, after having traveled all over the world, and you were right, there is. Um, I'm here in Durham, and there is a number of issues that we're dealing with, just like Raleigh is with gentrification and with uh, the things that are going on in society. While we love the uh, downtown uh, growth and the things that are happening in a positive nature, be that the Deepak, be that the Carolina Theater or some of the great restaurants, we do know that it has impacted um, the kind of gentrification and the fact that there are some people that can't afford those nice apartments that are in the downtown area. So what was it that drew you back to Raleigh and uh, what uh, keeps you here in the Raleigh area? Well, everywhere that I've been, uh, it's been because of my husband's um, career. And so we're back here again simply for that reason. So for me, I've had to, um, if you will, I call myself the Houdini wife because I'm basically for 34 years I've been traveling around the country and having to uh, adjust to different environments. And so I have to, I've had to, uh, use my professional experiences and my education to be creative in uh in in um in recreating myself to fit into these different environments that I've I've had to move into. So I call myself the Houdini wife for that reason because all of my traveling has been I've been uh, supporting uh, my husband in his career and um but it's been good for me because i've got i've accomplished some things i didn't think that i ever would um in my wildest dreams by moving around like this and having to readjust to all of these different environments uh learning how to deal with you know different people from different walks of life and so it's been a learning experience but it's been good it's it's been really good and it really actually helps me deal with some of the complexities that i've experienced since returning home because home is very different to me. I have not been here in 28 years. Yep, it's been and it's definitely changed and grown quite a bit, and it definitely is not the uh, city that it used to be. But uh, Dean probably can relate to you in terms of having that uh, relationship with your spouse that also is how y'all work together and do that because uh, Dean and his wife have been together for a number of years, and once again, I'll let him speak on that, but they are also, in my mind, I don't I don't have that pleasure of having either kids or a significant other in the sense of a wife, but I, when watching them and watching some of my other friends that are in those kind of relationships, it's always great when you see these folks that are um, – powerful together, powerful as a couple. So I don't want to speak for Dean. I'll let him talk about his wife and everything, but definitely I have a great deal of respect for both him and his wife and the work that they've done. So and it sounds like you and Derek are doing the same. So uh, Dean, jump in, share the story of you and your wife and what she's doing so that uh, Jacqueline can hear about that from your perspective. 
I mean, she's put up with me for 19 years and counting, so <laughs> it's, it, I am not the easiest person to get along with. And that was one of the things that when we first started dating, I had said to her, and her response was, okay. So, you know, once you get a response like that, where most people try to get you to explain how you're not, how you're difficult or what you what do you do that could be considered that? She didn't ask none of that stuff. She was just like, okay. And we've been together ever since. So, you know, she supports me and the things that I do. And in return, I do the same. And to have um, someone who you can bounce ideas off of and, and express how you really feel Sometimes you can't tell everybody how you really feel, but to have That's the truth, <laughs> you know, to have someone like that it is indeed a blessing. So you know, and to be it, able to try, <laughs> right? I can tell, I can tell her something, and I know it stays right there. I won't hear it again. Won't hear it from somebody else. Won't get questioned on why I said something. Won't get questioned on why I feel a certain way. It is what it is. We'll talk about it, and then we move on, you know. Yeah. Well, that is certainly yeah. the way it's supposed to be. It's a healthy relationship. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's what it sounds like you have with uh, Derek, Jacqueline. It sounds like y'all have a very healthy relationship and a relationship of mutual respect. So it seems like y'all have got that and are also taking care of that pool of y'all's smoky and everything. So it definitely sounds like y'all have a mutual respect while trying to do the pet raising that you're doing in addition to raising the uh, foundation. Because, by the way, as far as I'm concerned, foundations, organizations can also be like extra kids because I know that one of the things that I talk about is that my parents had both me and my younger brother, but they also had a radio station that they started when I was a preteen, and Malik, my younger brother, was actually even younger than that. So I don't know what he thinks about it because he was much younger, but as far as I'm concerned, that was like the third kid. So it sounds to me like y'all have the foundation and the poodle as y'all's kids and everything. So if you could just talk a little bit about how you balance the work life. Uh, kind of relationship because it does seem like y'all have done a good job of balancing both being work partners but also life partners and sometimes that can be difficult so how have y'all managed to balance that well you know um, Derek and I it, it's um, the important thing is this and I always tell people this um, you have to like somebody first before you can ever love them and I think that when you are um, in a relationship with the person that um, you are spending the rest of your life with, it's important that you like them. Some days you like them and and, uh, and you don't love them on that day. <laughs> but when you like a person, that's the foundation for being able to uh, talk through things. Um, and for us, balancing uh, work with personal lives, we know there's two separate worlds. But we also know that um, we're no good to anything that we set out to do if we're not, if we don't have it together. And so, um, really, it's about us um, being able to talk about things and being able to be honest with each other because we're not always going to agree on the same things. So we can do, um, we can agree to disagree sometimes, and, and and you know. Um, I know it sounds cliche, but that it, it really does exist. Sometimes you have to agree to disagree just to get along. And um, we know and understand each other's personalities, and we both have strong personalities. But I look to Derek. I lean on him because there's some things that um, he's experienced that I haven't experienced. And so when I encounter those things, I'm able to lean on him for that. And likewise, same way. And so that's how we're able to, to do what we do. But as far as the work part and working together, we also like to uh, make sure that the people in our circle understand us both. And um, I'll give you an example, like our board. Um, there, We have um, seven other board members in addition to ourselves. And when Derek and I walk into the boardroom, they forget that we're husband and wife because we're in the boardroom. 
if you will, if you understand what I'm saying. We don't show up as husband and wife. We show up as part of the team. And so we get into some heated things sometimes because I may not agree with something that he brings to the table. He doesn't agree with something. But we're able to work through that. And the people sitting in the room with us, they understand this is our way of working through that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and that's the way more organizations probably need to do that. Now, you also serve on another board as well, which is the Step Up Ministry, and that does work with uh, adults and children in terms of trying to help them with jobs and life skill training. So if you would, I'd love for you to share a little bit about what that organization is about as well, because I know that you're very proud of that organizational work in addition to what you're doing with the Derek Winberg Foundation. Now, my term has been up with Step Up Ministry. Uh, as a board member, I rolled off, but I have to say I'm very engaged in Step Up Ministry. I absolutely love that organization. Step Up Ministry is an organization that actually helps entire families um, with everything from uh, completing their uh, high school, getting a high school diploma, getting into college, getting a job, um, uh, help them through some issues they've been dealing with, with uh, maybe stuff that, you know, substance abuse may have led them down the wrong path. And it's one of the few organizations that actually focuses on um, recidivism, and I love that. And uh, Step Up, I have seen some amazing things happen there, some people who – and the thing I love about Step Up is not a handout. Step Up, you really have to work. Um, to be successful. It's a 12-step program. It's it's an entire year, and they assign each participant um, a mentor, and that mentor is somebody from the community professional who gives us their time and their expertise to work with these individuals to show them that, you know, you can have a better quality of life um, if you choose so, which you're going to have to work for it, and and, then Step Up provides that. And they, um, you know, Step Up also focuses on, they get to the root of the problem because it's not just the adult sometimes that walks through the doors that has the issue. They have a family. And because they have issues, it's triggered down to their children and to their grandchildren or whoever's living, you know, under the roof with them or in the same environment. Well, Step Up has programs that teach a family how to be a family and, and how to deal with some of those issues. You know, uh, if there's a woman who's a single parent, she's been unemployed for years, or she, you know, she's had issues with substance abuse, if she's willing to go through the rigorous program that Step Up has, I have seen incredible things happen there. Um, They have a graduation for these people who go through these programs. They go on to get, uh, I remember there was a story, um, Every year I go to the big luncheon that they have. It's their impact luncheon, and Step Up raises like $190,000 in one hour at this impact luncheon because it is the participants who've gone through the program that actually guide the, the, the um, you know, guide the whole luncheon. And they stand up, and when they tell their stories about where they came from and um, – where they are now as a result of going through tw- uh, Step Up program, it will just blow you out of your seat. It, it, it's a very emotional ride to see. And that's when you start to realize all people have to do is have someone to care and to teach them, to guide them in the right way, to let them understand that you can have a better quality of life. You don't have to be a product of your environment. None of that. You can defeat all of that if you're willing to do the work and provide that kind of assistance. And and it step up is so good that the people who go through the program they come to step up. Step up doesn't go out and recruit people to come there to receive their services. People come to that organization because it works. It's effective. They have a track record and. I love Step Up, and the um, executive director there is a dear friend of mine, and she's been there over 20-something years, and she's done an an amazing job. It started out with um, there was a church over in Oberlin, uh, on Oberlin Road, uh, White Memorial Presbyterian Church is where Mm -hmm. Step Up originated, and then they decided, you know, the church didn't want to be so 
involved in running the program anymore, and it sort of branched off and went uh, as a private nonprofit. And now um, uh, that's what they've been doing through the years. But Step Up has – there's um, – Step Up Raleigh is what the Step Up board that I set on, Step Up Raleigh. And then maybe uh, three years later, they were modeled and there's a uh, used as a model to have Step Up North Carolina. So now you have Step Up in Durham. There's Step Up in um, Winston-Salem, I believe, or Greensboro. Don't quote me on that, but I know that the Step Up Raleigh was used as a model to uh, set up this kind of uh, program uh, in in other cities. And I know that Durham um, is connected to the one, the branch off from the one in Raleigh. But it really is a wonderful organization. If you get a chance, you should definitely check out their uh, website and learn more about that organization. It's just wonderful. It really is. Yeah, I definitely have to go to the website, learn more about that organization, and maybe even try to reach out to your friend about being either on this show or one of our streaming podcasts as well. But definitely it sounds like they've got an amazing story that needs to be shared, not just locally, but with the world as well. So definitely I will do some research on that and possibly get them or members of their uh, staff involved with us on one level or another, because it definitely sounds like they're doing some great work in that field and everything. As you were talking, you were talking about what Step Up is doing. I was actually thinking about a conversation that I had earlier today on uh, one of the other programs I was on, and there was a gentleman, I think he's out of California, but he was talking about how um, there's so many things that we could be doing, and this actually comes back to somebody that I know is very special to your husband and everything, that being Jimmy V, but there's a lot of things that we could be doing to cure these things but we're bogged down in the bureaucracy of what's going on. As one that's been involved in science, would you agree with that? Because, I mean, he's of the opinion that there are, like, cures out there for things like sickle cell and for other things. But, unfortunately, because of the nature of the industries that control certain things, and I'll just call it the pharmaceutical industry and others, we might not be getting them as fast as we want to. Now, I agree with you what you said earlier. We don't want to rush the vaccines for um, COVID, but I was just wondering, do you sometimes feel that there are things that are out there that we actually could be having greater access to that we don't have? Because I know he was talking about sickle cell. I think he mentioned diabetes. He mentioned another of other diseases that he feels that we know what the cures are or maybe even have some access to them, but um, we're tied down in um, red tape. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are on what David, and I'm trying to think of David's last name's uh, thoughts were in that regard, because he just feels that we're maybe caught up in too much red tape bureaucratically. Well, you know, I don't think that way about everything. I, I, I feel like science is science, and uh, you can't rush science, none of that. Science is science. And so um, as far as now, I, I will say this, um, when you talk about um, health anomalies associated, you know, with with uh, where pharmaceutical companies, they, pharmaceutical companies control um, the price wars on medications that can help people. So I do think we do have a problem there. I think um, there needs to be more regulation when it comes to uh, how pharmaceutical companies conduct themselves in terms of making a drug, and particularly if it's the only drug, you know, that um, – can uh, slow the progression of a, a terminal illness or, or you know, um, I, I think it's important that there's more regulation to where they can't monopolize the industry, um, not so that that drug is not readily available for, for everybody or affordable um, for everybody. So I think there needs to be some regulation there. But as far as things, uh, I don't think anybody, and I can't find this in my heart to believe it, but I don't think that there's anybody who wants to see people die. And so as far as research for finding a cure, for instance, people have a tendency to think that it's that simple for cancer. There's so many types of cancers that by the time we're able to slow the progression of one or even, even um, eradicate one, there's another form happening. So it, it's a lot uh, going on in that world in terms of the research. But I will say to this, I will say this, and I, I've been telling um, uh, people this forever in a day. 
people of color, not just black people, Hispanic people, uh, anybody of color, we need to participate in clinical trials because our situation, and, and I'll talk about our people, about black people in general, we come, our health issues are directly related to our social, um, our economical status, um, geography, where we have, you know, forced to live because of our uh, social, our economic status. So all of those things are directly related. So our treatment, that uh, uh, you know, like I, you hear now that we have more people in the um, underserved communities who are dying of COVID. Well, that's directly related to where they are, to geography as to where they are. We need to do something to address that kind of stuff. But, no, I don't think that there are um, um, – I think there are some accessibility um, issues with getting uh, treatment into these areas and making it affordable and educating these people uh, on what their options are. But I don't think that there's um, there are things that are available in science like vaccines that uh, they're not putting out because – uh, they don't want us to have access to it. I don't think like that. I, I can't think like that because I can't imagine a human being who has the ability to, uh, you know, um, give people a chance to live would want folks to die by holding on to uh, um, treatment or vaccines or anything that would save that person's life. But I think the problem lies with, like I said, the drug wars with the pharmaceutical companies and also um, with the accessibility in underserved communities. And it also seems like we need to address issues even within our own community, because I had the pleasure of interviewing a couple of weeks ago a lady from UCLA who was involved in colon cancer research, and that's one of the things that she was saying was that we are actually very much hit by um, that in our community, meaning both colon cancer, prostate cancer with uh, I think the colon is with both men and women, prostate, of course, being with the man, and then definitely um, being hit hard by breast cancer among the uh, women in the African-American and other minority communities. So it does seem like we do need to go ahead and take those tests, which sometimes we're afraid to do because a lot of us don't like to go to the doctors, let's just be honest. A lot of us are afraid of going to the doctors for whatever reason. There might be a lot of baseless fears and things of that nature, but it does seem like that's something we should do on a regular basis. And I'm imagining that that's probably something that you encourage even your own husband as well as y'all's peers to do on a regular basis is to go for these tests that are hitting our community on a steady basis, not just the COVID test, but also those, like I mentioned, colon cancer, because I know a lot of that came up after uh, Chadwick passed away, the actor, that it became uh, something that came more into the light. But I was wondering your thoughts on that. Is that something that we need to do more of? Is not just the clinical trials, but also just our basic medical needs that we need. It, it goes back to that thing where I talking about education. It's all in that. We, you, I'll give you another example, and I keep using myself as an example here. The research that I did on fetal alcohol syndrome, after that research was completed and all of my presentations were done, the thesis and all that work, I felt like I needed to take that information into underserved communities. So I started going out. I used to sit on a board called United Activities Unlimited in New York, and um, it was that organization when the public school system decided to do away with all of the after-school programs, um, that organization came into play and got contracts with the city schools to continue uh, supporting those after-school programs. So one of the things that I found with all of the districts that we were working with, and a lot of them were in underserved communities, was a lack of education about the environment and what affects them and their health. And so I took the findings of my research into these schools and I would host roundtable discussions talking about um, the decisions that you make um, when you are under uh, the influence of alcohol or any other substance. 
And um, I talked about how it leads to birth defects and how it leads to fetal alcohol syndrome. And But the, the underlying issue is that the most important part of that was to educate them on why it is that you have to take care of yourself. And we got into the, of course, um, because of the age of the young people I'm talking to, we talked about promiscuity and um, how that leads to, uh, you know, drinking leads to promiscuity, which means you make a decision to uh, be engaged in sexual activity, and then you end up uh, with the possibility of giving birth of pregnancy and giving birth to a child who's affected by your bad decisions and and also by the uh, alcohol consumption, you end up with this child that has birth defects, which and anomalies associated with the consumption of alcohol during pregnancy. So I took that research and turned it into layman terms in the community where the education needed to be brought. But sometimes you have to speak on that. You have to to speak to where they can understand. I didn't come in and put up a bunch of statistics and all of this stuff. I came in and sat down and listened to some of their issues. And at this time, um, you know, teenage pregnancies is on the rise in these communities. And so I felt it was important to sit down and and talk to them about this. And then from that, you know, we, we had to go into prenatal care, the importance of that, because, you know, once you, you would hope that a 15 or 16-year-old doesn't even have to think about that. But because we're in that environment and these are the things that are happening, this is what I'm hearing from them, I had to use that research to talk about some of those things. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's definitely uh, something that folks need to be thinking about on a regular basis, and a lot of times folks don't even want to make that connection between alcohol and the pregnancy, but that is something that is very big in our society, and I know that that has even led to some folks being uh, coming into the earth with different kinds of ailments and things because of the fact of what was going on in that early stages of the pregnancy. So glad that you were doing that kind of work and finding that kind of of research that is definitely needed in our society on a regular basis. But a lot of times folks want to ignore these very basic things that should be researched on a regular basis. I know that sometimes even folks don't want to think about the impact that um, different kinds of drugs may have on folks when they're coming into the world as well. And we do know that there are folks that are engaged in different aspects of the drug culture as well, as well. But sometimes folks just kind of want to block that out, but that's not the kind of research that you were doing at that time. So it's great that you're still were doing that work then and are still staying engaged, even though you might not be doing the research directly, you're still doing your own personal research and staying engaged in that way. So how much of, um, have you totally given up the uh, research side of things or are you still doing research outside of the foundation or do you still uh, reach back and do some research every once in a while from your own background or have you now stepped back into the retirement realm of the research world? Well, I, I always like to stay abreast of what's happening. And if the opportunity, uh, you don't just go do research. There is a lot of different um, things that happen with that. And so if the opportunity presents itself and it's, it's uh, the right uh, situation for me, yes, I would love to do that again. That sounds good. And we've got folks that are listening from around the world, even here on uh, Blog Talk Radio. I know that we've teamed up with a group out of India that is starting to air our stuff, and I'm assuming that they're translating it for us, and then it's going to other parts of the globe as well. So if somebody was listening and they had a research project and they were listening to you right now and you were able to give them a pitch to do research, what is the kind of research that is calling you as a passion? Like what kind of research would you be wanting to do if that opportunity was to present itself? So who knows? Maybe somebody's listening that wants to give you that opportunity at some time or another. So if you had your dream research project, what would it be? Well, to con- uh, continue studying um, different uh, types of cancers and finding out, um, you know, what, uh, ways we can actually slow the progression of some of them. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and that is something very important. I know a number of folks are have family members or folks in their family that have definitely dealt with the various kinds of cancers and things of that nature. I know a number of other folks have always been interested in things around dementia and autism because I actually have a friend of mine in California that that's where her research is at, is in the field of autism because of her own uh, child having that. And I think her ex-husband also is involved in that spectrum. So a lot of times it is based on where we are and the kinds of things that are happening in our own lives. And then I know family members that have had folks that have had either dementia or Alzheimer's or other things. So I do know that a lot of times where our interest is is based on things that have happened in our own lives. So I'm imagining that probably the cancer research comes from a personal standpoint. So I'm thinking that maybe there were family members of your own that were impacted by cancer, and that's why it's such a deep passion of yours. Is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, Cancer has affected a lot of people, and, yes, it is personal to me as well. Definitely. So um, if you want to share any of those personal stories as to why it's important to you from a family standpoint, I'm sure our listeners would love to hear that. But if you want to leave that on the uh, plate as something that you don't want to share, I'm open with that as well. I I know some people don't mind sharing those stories and others like to keep them to themselves. So it's up to you. Well, I, 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 for me, um, I just think it's important that we understand, um, you know, um, we understand what our options are in terms of treatment. And so when, when a person is diagnosed with cancer, there's so many uh, different um, treatment options that may be thrown. It's overwhelming. It, it really can be overwhelming. And um, I had a situation where someone near to me was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, which is kind of like the the newest one on the, well, the toughest one to, to treat because it doesn't have receptors that bind to the hormones. And so it's a very difficult type of breast cancer to treat. And so I immediately threw myself into learning more about triple negative, what's going on there. Why is it that those um, receptors are not binding? And um, so I, I want to do more of that. And and so that really is where my interest is, is, is focusing on uh, not just breast cancer, but any rare form of cancer. Um, you know, I want to know why is it so difficult to, to treat them and what other pathways can uh, we treat them um, to to give these people, a, a, a you know, a fighting chance at life. And so... Um, that's, you know, where my interest is. And it is very no, that, personal. I mean, yeah. No, and I can understand that. I actually have a dear friend of mine who is a singer in the area, and they have actually been uh, and are in remission and in a state of remission, but they have been fighting breast cancer for a number of years and have definitely uh, gone through various treatments um, and have definitely uh, gone through the different styles of treatment in order to fight the disease, and like I said, as far as I know right now, it is in a state of remission, and hopefully it will stay that way. But I've also lost friends and family to different forms of cancer as well. So definitely I can relate to what you're saying about it being a personal battle because I have also gone through friends that have uh, dealt with different kinds of personal battles with their own cancers or their own ailments of different sorts. So definitely I can understand where you're coming at from that standpoint. So definitely can understand where you're saying from there. Um, Getting ready to wrap up. We've got about another 10 minutes or so to go in the show, about 13 minutes. But one of the things that me and Dean were talking about earlier, and then at the absolute end, I'll go with our usual wrap-up question. But one of the things we were talking about is that um, Dean was asking me how my day had gone, and I was involved with my streaming podcast uh, network, IBM.TV, and they were talking about International Day of Peace. Today is International Day of Peace and things of that nature. So I was just wondering if you could share in your own thoughts what that means to you when you hear the word peace and what peace means to you, and I'll probably share that with my friends at that network because I know that that's something they've been celebrating all day long, but I would love to hear you put it in your context what peace means to you, and it can be any type of peace. I mean, a lot of people would think of that in the sense of the conflict, but sometimes peace means something different to other folks. So definitely, what does peace mean to you, and how do you think we can go about trying to achieve that perfect union of peace? 
Well, peace to me is just spreading love and uh, letting people know that you care. I think that's the greatest peace, uh, greatest joy um, that you could bring, um, you could give. It's just letting people know that you care, just humanity. And so that's what peace means to me. And I, I try to live my life that, like that uh, every day. And, you know, some people um, make it a little bit more challenging for you. However, um, it's within me. And, you know, I, I believe the more love you can spread, uh, the more peaceful the world becomes. Yeah, definitely can agree with that. What are some of the hardest lessons that you have learned? Like you said, you've been at this for a while. You've been with Derek for a while. You had the pleasure of uh, knowing some great leaders, whether that was, I imagine you met John Lewis. I know you probably met John Valvano. So what are some of the lessons that you've learned and everything from your own life and from some of the people that you have met? I said, John, I met Jimmy Valvano. But what are some of the lessons that you have learned that are resonate the most with you, and where did you get those lessons from? Well, um, <clears throat> I was blessed and fortunate enough to have my mother in my life um, up until just this year. She gave the world 92 years, uh, 92 beautiful years. And I got to experience that, and I'm not afraid to share my age. I got to experience 58 of her 92 years on this earth. And that woman inspired me to be everything that I am. And so I have to say, yes, I've met some wonderful people along the way, but none as great as my mother. And uh, she just, you know, instilled with me. She showed me how to love. She laid a foundation for me how to respect myself so that I can not um, ever have to uh, demand respect that it automatically comes. Um, she is the reason I'm the woman I am today. And so um, she's the most prolific person I've met in my lifetime. And I've met some great people, but my mother, um, um, I'm blessed. I'm blessed that I, you know, I, I had her in my life all of these years. And um, it, uh, every single day I wake up, you know, with, I have a spiritual connection with my mother because even now I need her guidance every day, and I know I'm going to need it for as long as I live because I've always had her to guide me along this uh, rugged, sometimes rough terrain of, 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 of the world. And so I just hold steadfast to all of the positive things that she taught me about strength and about growing, about dealing with challenges, um, so I would have to say that person for me is definitely was definitely my my mother. Yeah, I can relate to that. My mom, who is still living and is still giving me advice to this day. Like I said, I was talking to her yesterday, and I might call her again tomorrow or Wednesday. But definitely, I can relate to that, and I'm fortunate that both my mother and my dad are still living. Uh, they actually had uh, me as their first child at a relatively young age, so they're a little bit younger than uh, your mother um, was when, or mm-hmm. uh, well, would be now, because uh, dad is 80 and still very much involved in his art world. Uh, you know, he's done other things in his career, including being a teacher at UNC and being involved in uh, civil rights struggles to some degree, as well as being involved in a farm collective. And of course, he and my mom started a radio station up in Warren County. So they are definitely some folks that I have a great deal of admiration for, as uh, I also have for, like I said, my mom, that was my dad, I'm talking about, did all that, but mom started that radio station along with dad and was a guidance counselor there in Raleigh and has also been involved in a number of things in the, the nonprofit world, including being on the rural center board. So definitely that's something that I can relate to having somebody in your life that means a lot to you because I'm definitely connected to both of my parents and still talk to them on a regular basis for advice. And that's something I wish more of our young folks would do was go to the elders and not just the elders that are the birth elders, meaning their mother, dad, uncles, and aunts, and all of that, but also the elders in the community. Because I do sometimes feel that too often they uh, go head first in without asking for the advice that they could get from some of the elders. But I've also really been uh, impressed by what some of the young leaders are doing in terms of taking a leadership role. So don't want folks to think yeah. that I don't take their thoughts and 
as well, because I have really been impressed as how uh, many of them have stepped into their own light and taken leadership roles. So I was wondering if you would uh, reflect on that as well, because I know what my thoughts are is that we're seeing a lot of young leaders, be that the BLM movement, be that uh, Greta and the peace movement, or a number of other folks that are actually stepping out into their limelight and doing some great work, even though they are young in age, I find many of them to be maybe that old adage of an old spirit. Um, I was just wondering your thoughts on that, Jacqueline. I think there are a lot of great young leaders out here doing some amazing things, and I think they're being successful because they are doing exactly what you just said. They're going to people who have already walked in those shoes and had those experiences, and they're sitting down and talking with them and asking them questions on how uh, those, the experiences, the things that they experienced, how they relate to what's happening now. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of these young leaders are being successful and they are reaching the people that they need to reach is because they are going back and they are sitting down and talking to uh, some of the uh, elder people who have lived through probably worse than what we think is, is bad now. And so, um, yeah. There's some young people doing some great things out there, and I love people who are willing to take on a leadership role. Um, but you have to know what you stand for when you do that. Yeah, you definitely have to do that. You have to do that on a regular basis. There's no doubt about that. Um, one of the things we do when we wrap up the show is we always ask people if they can give words of encouragement and uh, what their thoughts are about um, how they would pass on a positive thought to the folks that are listening. And, of course, like I said, we got folks from around the globe. So if you would just share a positive thought or something that you would give to folks to encourage them during these hard times that we're going through, whether that's around race relations, whether that's what we're going through with the pandemic, whether that's what we're going through, a lot of us individually, economically, um, I would love to hear your words of encouragement. And then, of course, me and Dean will give our wrap-up thoughts as well and then tell folks about what we've got coming up in the upcoming shows here on the network and everything. But I would love to hear your positive thoughts as to a word of encouragement for those that are listening. Well, the biggest uh, piece of advice I can give, and, and this has been a great time to do this because we've had more time on our hands to reflect on things than we ever wanted right now because of this pandemic. So um, if you could just ask yourself and be honest with the answer that you give, what am I good at? Because I think once you find out what it is that you're good at, that leads to what you are passionate at, and then that passion leads to your success in doing what it is that you've discovered that you're good at. And so if you can do that, because oftentimes people think success is something that they can mimic from someone else or that it's given to you or that you can buy it or you can, you know, um, it, it's not that. Your success is determined by your ability to assess yourself and see what it is that you're good at and how you can turn that into something great to help other people. And so um, that's my advice. If you could just be true to yourself and, and ask those questions to yourself and then um, discover what your passion is. And yeah, if you know what you're passionate, you're passionate about something, it's going to lead to success. You can only be successful in it because it's your passion. It's your baby. That's very true. Dean, you've heard from another amazing guest giving us some great thoughts and all of that. And, by the way, if you would, one more time, tell folks how they can reach you and the website for the Derek Witten Foundation. And then I want um, definitely Dean to come on and share his thoughts about the messages that you have shared. But, uh, Jacqueline, I would like to give you one more opportunity to pass on the information about the Derek Wittenberg Foundation and also how folks can reach you if they're interested in doing that. Okay. Our website is the dwfoundation.org. That's T-H-E-D as in dog, wfoundation.org. Um, I can be reached at email at education at the dwfoundation.org. And um, I am available for any conversation. So if you um, want to reach out to me via phone, there's a number on the website that you can contact me at. 
Um, but the email, um, I, I'm on top of it, so education at the dwfoundation.org. But please do visit the website um, at the dwfoundation.org. And also, like us on our social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Medium. And um, everything that this foundation is about, you'll be able to find there because we're very transparent in the work that we do and the students that we serve. So please go to those social media pages and like the Derek Wittenberg Foundation. Yep, definitely. We definitely have to have that going on you know, on a uh, regular basis, having folks reach out to you and all of that. Dean, what did you think? We had another amazing guest. So I just wanted to, you to come in and uh, share your thoughts on what sure, Jacqueline sure. was sharing. And then, uh, of course, talk about what we've got coming up on our uh, network and what uh, other exciting shows we've got. And, of course, I'm lining up more guests for us next week. So <laughs> still in the process of doing that. But, you know, we're always having these great conversations. So I would love to hear your thoughts about uh, – what's happened, and uh, <clears throat> your message to uh, Jacqueline as well. Well, in, in short, you know, uh, <laughs> we thank you for spending time and, and, and taking time out of your day to impart some wisdom on us, powerful words, powerful message, powerful foundation. And like you said, the mantra, the foundation is dream, believe, work, now, finish. And that could go for anything you know like i know years ago my grandfather used to say all the time and i didn't figure out what it meant until i got older he said if a task is once begun never leave it till it's done be the labor great Mm -hmm. or small do it well or not at all and as i got older i understood what that meant and for what you all are doing you are to be commended and, and we appreciate you all right Thank you so much. Indeed, indeed. So, for, could you said it any better, Dean? If you would share with folks uh, what we've got coming up, I know that uh, we've got probably episodes of She's On Call, the Just Podcast, and a number of other things coming our way. I will be sending you that uh, audio that you'll put on the network of the radio show that features Simon Tam and Don Reno Langley. So that's one of the things we've got coming up. But tell folks what they can expect on the network and uh, just how we're trying to engage people in these great conversations. And by the way, Jacqueline, I do want to let you know, you are welcome to come back here anytime to share what you and the Derek Wittenberg foundation are doing. You know, if you want to bring Derek on one time, we would love that as well, but y'all are always welcome back here to engage us in conversation here with what y'all are doing, even if you want to come back in November when the golf tournament is closer at hand and anybody that you want to send our way. And, of course, we are part of several networks because, of course, we're here on Blog Talk Radio. We have our own radio network, and uh, me and Dean are part of the IBM um, streaming podcast network as well. So definitely there are many avenues that we can help g- plug you into in order to continue these conversations. So definitely consider yourself part of the family and know that you are always welcome to come and join us on any of these platforms. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on this evening, and I'm going to take you up on that offer. So we'll <laughs> be chatting soon. All right. Sounds great. <laughs> So uh, right, well, share with them once again what we got, and then, uh, like I said, I'll uh, maybe come in with a couple of very fast thoughts, but if you'll let folks know about what we've got coming up and how we just keep growing, because like I said, I've, I'm not even counting the countries, because as far as I'm concerned, because I know I think our sister affiliation on uh, – IBM.TV has gotten themselves in like 125 countries, maybe close to 200. So since we're part of that same family, I'm claiming the 200 as well. So as far as I'm concerned, we're in 50 states and almost 200 countries as far as I'm concerned because we're all part of a growing media network because like uh, between the different organizations that we have tied in together, um, all I got to say is, um, and I'm just going to spell them out, CBS, ABC, PBS, look out. There's some new players in town, and we're coming to bring y'all some serious storm and some serious information. So if y'all can't hang, get over it. <laughs> hey, you know what? Well, you know what? I'll, I'll just put it like this, y'all. It's the international podcast, better known as Straight Talk with Dana Mark, 7 o'clock Monday night, Eastern Standard Time, here on blogtalkradio.com. 
backslash squared 807. Don't forget to check the replays tomorrow afternoon and Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock on the Skyhawk Radio Network based out of North Carolina. And if you miss those, we got even more replays. We got replays on Radio Public, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Podcast Addict, CastBox, Podfollow, a brand new one that I can't pronounce, but by next week I'll have it down packed. And right here on Blog Talk Radio, we're part of the Level Podcast Network where you can catch shows like Virginia Interface Live, WNC Original Music, the Let's Talk About It Radio Show, Funk from the Front Seat, the Just Podcast, Mona Shakes Minority Report. The Mark Lee Show, Mulling Music and Memories with Mark Lee, The Plant of Good Seed Podcast with Tish Oakley, Funk Music with Zach Robeson, The Finish Social Hour, The Online Dinner Party with Mark Lee, The Chef Gang Radio Show, and us. Yes, like I said, we just keep coming at them left and right, and we just keep adding and trying to find new ways to tie folks into this amazing network we've got. One thing I can tell you is that I'm already in conversation with some folks, so whether it's out of the activism community, whether it's out of the creative community, or whether it's out of the education community, or maybe they're a mixture of all of those, but you can be sure that right now and throughout the course of this week, I will be reaching out, finalizing things, and we will have at least one, if not several more amazing guests on next week because like i said we are engaging in a regular and amazing conversations to share our knowledge but also to have the knowledge of others passed on to this global community so definitely looking forward to having some more outstanding guests next week still trying to finalize who those guests will be so that's why i can't give you a specific name but do know that i am in conversations and we will have some great guests coming your way on next Monday, the 28th. And by the way, I think Dean just referenced it earlier, but as soon as the sun rises on tomorrow, we will be in the first day of fall. That's right. We have now exited summer, and we're now getting ready to go into fall. So it is about to be the first day of fall starting tomorrow. And we also know that that means we still have to be safe and not just dealing with what's going on with the COVID pandemic, but also remember that at least here in the South, we are in the middle of hurricane season, and I think we still got another six weeks to go of that. So we've already flipped, I think, into the B letters after having gone through some other letters. So they said it was going to be an active season, and we still got, I think, five or six more weeks to go there. And of course, we've got several weeks to go until we figure out um, what's going to happen in the election. And I agree with something that Dean said earlier. Somebody that's sitting in that office right now needs to pack his bag because I'm hoping and I'm praying on a regular basis that he's going to be having a new residence. I don't know where that residence is going to be. It might not even be in this country. I've heard speculations of Florida, but I've also heard speculations of Russia. But wherever it is, it doesn't need to be 1600 after we get the election accomplished and he has to move to a new location in the uh, latter part of January. So right now we're in fall. I'm hoping that in winter he's moving to a new house. What do you think, Dean? Hopefully he will, but you know what? I'm about to take off real quick and catch some of this football game. So like I always say, when you walk outside your front door, it's showtime and the world is your stage. Just make sure that people are not watching the rehearsal. But that being said, it's the six-man Dean Geronimo signing off. Have an outstanding week. We see y'all in seven days. And we'll catch you then.